Peace be with you and the mercy and blessings of God. Or to say that in Arabic, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin by praising our Creator and Fashioner, and I ask Him to send peace and blessings upon all of His prophets and messengers uh, and upon all of us. The mandate before us tonight is to think about the question of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Did the crucifixion and resurrection occur in fact, or is uh, there something wrong uh, with uh, the reports that uh, purport these to be facts? Well, it seems that from the Quranic perspective, Muslims would think that Jesus was neither killed nor crucified, and therefore that he did not raise from the dead. The Quran says in Surah 4, verse 157, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ As for the saying, they killed Jesus, the Messiah, uh, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. Uh, they neither killed him nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكِّمْ مِنْ And those who differ about the matter are in doubt concerning it. They have no knowledge about the matter, but only follow a conjecture. They killed him not for certain. The following verse says, But God raised him to himself. And God is mighty wise. From these passages of the Quran, these two verses, Surah 4, verse 157 and 158, Muslims would hold that we agree with our Christian friends that God raised Jesus to heaven. Acts of the Apostles and uh, Luke's Gospel testify that uh, Jesus was raised up. Muslims can assent to this without necessarily thinking that the ascension took place at that time uh, that is mentioned either in Luke's Gospel or in, in the Acts of the Apostles. But nevertheless, that at some time and in some manner, God raised Jesus to himself and therefore exalted Jesus above the charges of his enemies. What precisely were the charges of his enemies uh, is not uh, spelled out in the Quranic text, but we know from uh, other sources that uh, there were expectations that some individuals would appear on earth. Uh, one expectation that is quite popularly known from the New Testament is that Elijah uh, would return. But there was also an expectation of uh, some individuals who will be referred to as Messiah. The Dead Sea Scrolls give evidence that there were three persons who might qualify as Messiah. The term Messiah actually means an anointed person. It means a person who has been set aside uh, for a special task for the service of God. Three persons, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, would qualify as Messiah. One would be a priestly Messiah, one would be a prophet Messiah, and one would be a king Messiah. The king Messiah was of, speci was of special interest. Uh, David uh, ruled over Israel during the period of the Golden Age of Israel uh, in, in the ages prior to Christ. Uh, but uh, soon after uh, that, uh, the kingdom was divided between north and south, and various invaders came in and took over power. The latest power was that uh, of the Romans, ruling in the time of Jesus. Uh, the Jews agitated for someone to return, or for someone to come and rule in the place of David. There was an expectation that there would be a Messiah. One who is a descendant of David, who will sit on the throne of David and rule Israel again. The New Testament Gospels depict that Jesus was this Messiah. Now, a difficulty arises in that if he was this particular Messiah, then he could not be killed. Perhaps the Jews had in mind the Jewish opponents of Jesus, we should say, because his own followers were Jewish. So we're not speaking about all Jews, but those who opposed him, they might have had the impression that if they could do away with Jesus, if they could kill him, then that would prove that he is the false claimant to being the Messiah. That would prove definitively, definitively once and for all that he could not be the Davidic Messiah. Hence, their boast... We killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. They mockingly now refer to him as Messiah because by killing him, 
they disprove any claim that he is the Messiah, uh, at least of that Davidic descent. The Quran then comes to the defense of Jesus and says, They killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. The details of what, particularly, of what had transpired at the moments uh, that the Gospels describe are not described in the Quran. So now we must go to the Gospels to find out what precisely uh, is described about the crucifixion event. The Gospels insist that Jesus died on a cross and that uh, a couple of days later, he began to appear again alive to his disciples. So two points the Gospels tell us. First, that Jesus died, and second, that he was raised back to life. Christians taking the Gospels to be the Word of God would have no doubt that Jesus died and, and was resurrected again. However, when we come into a dialogue of this nature, we want to look at independent attestation, we want to say, okay, that's what the Gospels say, but if one did not already take it to be the Word of God, is there any reason why one would believe that Jesus actually died on the cross and that Jesus resurrected from the dead? Now, the idea that Jesus died on the cross is not a difficult one for people to believe. And so we hardly require great evidence or extraordinary evidence to prove such a simple assertion. To assert that a man had been publicly executed is not an unusual sort of claim. And if somebody tells us that somebody was executed, we have no difficulty believing that. It is for this reason that historians coming shortly after Jesus in the middle of the first century and into the second century, have no difficulty saying and agreeing with Christians that Jesus died on the cross. They think that crucifixion was a shameful death, and Christians would not have invented the idea that Jesus was crucified. Christians, in fact, had the great difficulty of trying to explain how could Jesus be the Son of God if he was crucified on a Roman cross. To the early Christians, this was an embarrassment. And the fact that the Gospels attest to and agree to the fact that Jesus was crucified and they try to explain how it could be so that a good man could be crucified like that, that means for historians of the period that the crucifixion must be taken as a fact, that Jesus was executed under Roman author authorities and that he died thereby. The other part is a little bit more difficult to believe. It is an extraordinary claim. The claim that a man, once dead, has now come back to life. It is for this particular claim that people would require some sort of evidence. Indeed, once this claim is made, not only would folks be requiring evidence that Jesus really did come back to life, but one would now be asking, how can you be sure that he died in the first place? Because usually, if a man is known to be alive after he was rumored to have died, we might think that the rumors of his death uh, have been greatly exaggerated. So now it looks like we have two tasks before us. At least John will have to establish clear evidence, independent evidence, to show that in the first place, Jesus really died, especially in light of the fact that there is a claim that he appeared alive again after he was once thought to be dead. Because every homicide detective knows that a person must have died sometime after the last time he was seen alive. So if Jesus was seen alive, as described in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles, for 40 days after the crucifixion event, a homicide detective would tend to think that uh, perhaps Jesus died sometime after uh, the, he was last seen, and therefore that he did not actually die at the moment when the Gospels depict him as having died, meaning that he could not have therefore died on, on the cross. So one would have to have some independent attestation, some firm evidence to prove that Jesus really died on the cross in the first place. Second, one would have to have clear evidence uh, th that Jesus did really come back to life. So let's uh, think about the last part first. Did Jesus really come back to life? Now the story in the Gospels have it that Jesus was crucified on the cross, uh, that he died, and then he was taken down. His corpse was put not in a shallow grave, but uh, in a, a tomb in which if a person were alive, we should add now, he would have some breathing space. The tomb was closed with a rock. Now, that was Friday evening, but on Sunday morning, when some of his female disciples came to examine the tomb, they found that the tomb had been opened, 
and Jesus was not there. This means for us that no one actually witnessed the moment of the resurrection. Matthew's gospel is unique in telling us that there were guards placed on the tomb, that some angels came down and rolled away the stone, and at that moment, the, the guards, seeing the angels, became unconscious and fell as though they were dead. So the guards themselves did not actually witness the, crucif the, the resurrection event. What knocked them out uh, into unconsciousness was their sight of the angels. So we still have it that no one has actually seen Jesus coming back to life uh, from the dead. But there are reports in the Gospels that Jesus began to appear to his disciples. However, these reports are themselves very problematic. Look what happens. Matthew's Gospel tells us that after Jesus, uh, after this event, when the guards had been knocked to unconsciousness, eventually they came back to their consciousness and went into town and told the uh, Jewish uh, priests about what had happened, and they were bribed to keep quiet about it. So the only persons who actually came the closest as possible to, witness any, to witnessing anything like the resurrection event are somehow made to keep quiet by a simple bribe. And this is extraordinary that they would have agreed to that. Nevertheless, it is reported that the women, having now come to examine the tomb and found it empty, nevertheless uh, see angels who inform them as to what had happened and inform them that they are to go tell the disciples of Jesus to go to Galilee where they will see Jesus. Now on the way, as the women were uh, going to tell the disciples, they themselves meet Jesus and they touch him. Matthew, that's Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 28. But now you can read uh, John chapter 20, chapter 20. John chapter 20 says that Mary Magdalene, who was one of the women we know from the other uh, narrative from Matthew's gospel, she had come to the tomb and she speaks in the plural, so apparently she's there with a group of, this, of women disciples, just as Matthew's gospel had already told us. And she, now finding the tomb empty, returns to the disciples and says to them, They have taken the Lord away, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now why would she say something like this if she had just met Jesus on the way and touched him? Why would she say, They have taken the Lord away, and we do not know where they have put him? You see, Matthew and John have two different ideas about what happened on that uh, Easter morning, that first Easter. And uh, event, moments like this in the Gospels uh, make us wonder if in fact we can depend on the uh, claim that Jesus really uh, came back to life after death. Many commentators, such as Raymond Brown in his two-volume commentary on John's Gospel, uh, says that uh, the Gospels r differ with each other in substantial uh, manners regarding the time and place and to whom Jesus uh, appeared. Well, let's think uh, some more. We can see that uh, Paul, one of the early writers uh, of the New Testament documents, in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, says that Jesus, having come back to life, appeared first to Peter, then to the twelve, and then to five hundred. Well then, if we ask, when did Jesus appear to the twelve, the answer has to be at no time, because there never by this time was a twelve. There were originally 12 disciples, but Judas Iscariot had betrayed his master, and so we are left with 11 disciples, Jesus, Judas Iscariot having by now been dead. So Jesus must have appeared to the 11. Indeed, Luke's gospel tells us that on that Easter day, when Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room, there were 11. So there were no 12. Moreover, John's Gospel tells us that on the Easter evening, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, there were only ten. Well, John does not explicitly say there were ten, but he says that Thomas was absent. So, since Thomas is one of the eleven, and he was absent, a simple math tells us that there were only ten. So here we have it. According to John's Gospel, on that first uh, occasion, there were ten disciples. According to Luke's gospel, by explicit statement, there were 11 disciples. 
And according to Paul's statement, there were 12 disciples. Now we know definitively that Paul's statement is incorrect because there, there, there were no 12. And uh, we are now at a toss-up between John saying 10 and Luke saying 11. Now we have reason for, for doubting that John is accurate here because some commentators such as uh, the great scholar James Dunn think that uh, John uh, has, uh, and Raymond Brown, uh, think that John has actually removed Thomas from the scene here in order to give us the drama of Jesus appearing to Thomas. The original story is that Jesus appeared to his uh, disciples on that Easter day. And now John wants to give us a dramatic story about Thomas being absent, doubting the story, doubting that Jesus has now appeared to his disciples, so that Jesus a week later appears to them again when Thomas is present. And it is on this occasion that Jesus answers not only the doubt of Thomas, but the doubt of any doubting Thomas evermore. John has seen to it that no one will ever doubt the story. But in order for John to accomplish this, he has removed Thomas from the initial scene, and he has created another dramatic appearance. You see how the gospel writers write. They have certain theological views and apologetic purposes. They want to defend certain claims and certain beliefs. They want to promote those beliefs to us, and they tell us stories in order to promote those beliefs. So then, in sum, we can hardly put complete trust in these documents. At least this is how it would appear to me, and I'm sure that John, my colleague, will shed more light on why Christians would have complete confidence in the narratives as they are. So the Gospels really differ as to whom Jesus appeared to and when. What about where? The Gospel of Matthew, we've already learned, had it that Jesus said that the disciples are to go to Galilee where they will see Jesus. And indeed, eventually they do go to Galilee. Luke's Gospel has it that Jesus appears to his disciples right there in Jerusalem. And Luke's Gospel has it in chapter 24 that Jesus, having appeared to his disciples, specifically tell them that they're not to leave the city until they receive the promise from on high. And everyone agrees, and the Gospel of Luke makes it clear in Acts of the Apostles, that the promise that is referred to here is the event at Pentecost, which occurs some 50 days after the crucifixion event. So if the disciples see Jesus on Easter Sunday, the first Easter Sunday, and they are to remain in Jerusalem until 50 days later, during which time Jesus does continue to appear to them. When did the disciples go to Galilee to see Jesus in Galilee as depicted in Matthew's Gospel? As James Dunn, James Dunn says in his book, Jesus Remembered, there simply wasn't enough time for the disciples to go to Galilee and see Jesus there and then come back to see Jesus as depicted in Luke's Gospel. And yet, the, the appearance of Jesus in Galilee as depicted in Matthew's Gospel is obviously the first time that Jesus is appearing to his disciples because when they see him, they doubt it. And it is hardly likely that they would continue to doubt after they have seen him numerous times as depicted also uh, already in Luke's Gospel. So not only do the Gospels differ as to when Jesus appeared and to whom he appeared, but also to they differ in where Jesus appeared. A further difficulty in the narratives is that when Jesus appears, he apparently is not recognized as Jesus from his appearance and voice. Think, for example, of Jesus in the garden uh, uh, appearing to Mary of, of Mag Mary of Magdala. Mary speaks to him. He speaks to her. But she doesn't recognize that this is Jesus. She thinks that this is the gardener. Why? After hearing his voice, she does not recognize him. It is only when he said to her, Mary, that uh, she came to realize that this is her teacher, and she said, Rabuni, which means my, my, my teacher. When Jesus appeared in Matthew's Gospel, we've already seen in Matthew 28, verse 17, that they doubted. 
Some translators render it that some doubted. But even if only some of the disciples doubted, we should wonder, what's there to doubt? They see him, they worship him, but some doubted? Why would they doubt? If, if any one of us should see a, a, a departed relative now alive to us again, we would be so overjoyed, I suppose, that uh, there would hardly be any reason for doubt. Obviously, either the person appears like the person you know, or he doesn't appear like the person you know. If he doesn't appear like the person you know, how do you know this is the same person whom you think your dead relative to be? And if he does appear like your dead relative, the same person you know, what's there to doubt? So the, the reports are indeed rather strange. When Jesus appears to his disciples on the uh, shore of the lake of Tiberias uh, in uh, John's Gospel chapter 21, again there is apparently some doubt because John's Gospel has it that they sat there and have breakfast with him. He apparently cooked the breakfast for them. Uh, and uh, no one dared to ask him who he was because they were sure that this was Jesus. Now why should it be put like that? Why should it ever occur to anyone to say, well, nobody dared to ask him who he was because uh, they were sure it was Jesus? Obviously, they had some lingering doubt, and uh, they're talking about it later on, and they realize that uh, they did not really ask him, and they should have at the time. On the road to Emmaus in Luke's Gospel, two disciples are walking along, and Jesus joins them on the road. And he has a long conversation with them until they reach their destination uh, by evening. And when he broke bread, that is when they realized that this was Jesus, but he vanished from their sight. And they began to say to each other, weren't our hearts burning when he spoke to us on the country road? Now, if two persons are walking on the country road, and a third person comes along and joins in their conversation, naturally they're going to look up to see who is this stranger who has joined in our conversation. So they obviously saw Jesus. In any case, he spoke to them at length. They heard his voice. And they didn't recognize that this was Jesus. Only when he broke bread. What happened when he broke bread? Did he break bread in a particular way that reminds them of their master and the manner in which he used to break bread? Did he have some marks of crucifixion on his hands so that when he broke bread that they could see that this was Jesus? But the problem remains, why did they not recognize him from his face? So unless we have clear evidence from someone saying that they really did see Jesus and they can attest to this fact, it looks like we do not have any clear evidence that Jesus really resurrected from the dead. But let's, let's look at the other question. There are two questions. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. The first question about the crucifixion. Crucifixion can have two meanings. One, a person was hung on the cross. So when Mark says that Jesus was uh, crucified uh, at, the, you know, um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, the, he is obviously using crucifixion in that first sense. A person is merely hung on the cross. When a Christian says that Jesus was crucified for our salvation, the Christian does not mean that Jesus was merely hung on a cross. The Christian means that Jesus was uh, hung on a cross such that he died on, on the cross and hence secured our salvation. So we have two meanings of crucifixion. One, peace be with you and the mercy and blessings of God. Or to say that in Arabic, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, and I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers, uh, and upon all of us. The mandate before us tonight is to think about the question of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Did the crucifixion and resurrection occur in fact, or is uh, there something wrong uh, with uh, the reports that uh, purport these to be facts? Well, it seems Messiah. The Dead Sea Scrolls give evidence that there were three persons who might qualify as Messiah. The term Messiah actually means an anointed person. It means a person who has been set aside uh, for a special task for the service of God. Three persons, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, would qualify as Messiah. One would be a priestly Messiah, one would be a prophet Messiah, and one would be a king Messiah. The king Messiah was of, speci was of special interest. Uh, David uh, ruled over Israel during the period of the Golden Age of Israel, 
in, in the ages prior to Christ. It seems that from the Quranic perspective, Muslims would think that Jesus was neither killed nor crucified, and therefore that he did not raise from the dead. The Quran says in Surah 4, verse 157, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ As for the saying, they killed Jesus the Messiah, uh, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. Uh, they neither killed him nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكِّمْ مِنْ And those who differ about the matter are in doubt concerning it. They have no knowledge about the matter, but only follow a conjecture. They killed him not for certain. The following verse says, But God raised him to himself. And God is mighty wise. From these passages of the Quran, these two verses, Surah 4, verse 157 and 158, Muslims would hold that we agree with our Christian friends that God raised Jesus to heaven. Acts of the Apostles and uh, Luke's Gospel testify that uh, Jesus was raised up. Muslims can assent to this without necessarily thinking that the ascension took place at that time uh, that is mentioned either in Luke's Gospel or in, in the Acts of the Apostles. But nevertheless, that at some time and in some manner, God raised Jesus to himself and therefore exalted Jesus above the charges of his enemies. What precisely were the charges of his enemies uh, is not uh, spelled out in the Quranic text, but we know from uh, other sources that uh, there were expectations that some individuals would appear on earth. Uh, one expectation that is quite popularly known from the New Testament is that Elijah uh, would return. But there was also an expectation of uh, some individuals who will be referred to as messiahs.